Bismillah Walhamdulillah Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala First of all my dearest sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh it's such a pleasure to have you all here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala each and every one of you for giving up your Sunday morning to come and remind yourself about Allah and the Akhirah, inshallah, and especially to get ourselves motivated and ready for Ramadan. Bi'idhnillahi ta'ala. My dearest sisters, as we all know, one of the greatest struggles that many of us face as women is that, you know, we all want to get close to Allah Ta'ala in this month and to feel the closeness and sweetness of praying to Allah and our ibadah in this month. But subhanAllah, we find that what happens is because of how many responsibilities we have and the busy schedules that we have, all of that tends to get in the way and take away from that time that we have that we want to dedicate towards you know, focusing on getting close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this month. And, you know, we find in the end we're, we're constantly running after our children, we're busy in the kitchen, and we find little time for ourselves to really sit down and just focus on our ibadah. <clears throat> and, you know, some of you may not be mothers, but you may be struggling with assignments or exams, and all of that makes you feel burnt out, and you can feel resentful. When you look at others who are having that time, to peacefully recite the Quran and you know get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as I was saying, subhanAllah, many times we can feel quite resentful. You know, you may even get to feel quite resentful when you see other people sitting there enjoying their recitation of the Quran, you know, going maybe even it's your husband, you know, he's going off to the mosque and he's enjoying his tarawih and anti kaf in peace. Meanwhile, you're at home, subhanAllah, struggling with the kids and you can hardly find time to you know, enjoy your prayers. So that's why, what I wanted to speak about today is how we can get the most out of Ramadan despite how busy we may be. And I'm going to go through a lot of points, but inshallah at the end, if you have any further things you want to talk about, we can go into that as well. Okay, so the first step, if we want to try to have the Ramadan that we wish for, is we need to free up, you know, as much time as we can for Ramadan beforehand. So you need to plan ahead. Okay, your goal must be to plan ahead and to free up as much time as you can. So you need to think ahead of what's going to happen in Ramadan and what are the things that you can maybe do now to get them out of the way so that you have more time in Ramadan. So what does that mean? It means anything you're able to drop from your schedule that you can get rid of, things that's not really that necessary, those are the things you should be trying to drop out of your schedule to free up your time. Appointments, postpone them if you can. You know, if you, like, if you possibly can cut down on your work schedule, like if you work, if you can possibly take a bit more time off or cut down your work schedule, anything that's not necessary for you, uh, try to get it out of the way or postpone it. Like, same thing with assignments. If you've got assignments due, you know they're due in Ramadan, you try to get them due, you know, you try to get them done before Ramadan. You know, exams. If you have exams, try, you know, we've still got, you know, a week and a bit. You could, inshallah, use this time to try to put in a bit of extra effort to try to get some of that study done before Ramadan comes. Another very important point that really helps, and that is if you can possibly spring clean your house before Ramadan comes. This is also one of the things that's going to save you a lot of time when Ramadan comes. A lot of people, as you know, they tend to spring clean their house before Eid. They waste many, many days in the Ramadan spring cleaning the house, where that could have been used, you know, doing Muraja'ah of the Quran, reciting the Quran, revising. So they, they, they burn up that time instead. So that's why if you can possibly spring clean the house before Ramadan comes, because that way, sisters, the first day of Ramadan comes and all that's required from you is to sit down and start, open up your mushaf and start reciting, because you know everything's done. You, you feel your mind is free because you know you've done everything you need to do for the house, so all you've got to do is focus on your ibadah. So that should be what we should be aiming for. Another thing is if you know that you have to invite certain people for iftar, all right? If possible, try to get 
those, you know, if you've got to do like pastries or sweets, you try to get those done now before Ramadan comes. Even eat sweets. Some people spend the last part of Ramadan doing all their eat sweets. So if you can possibly do that before Ramadan comes, that's going to save you a lot of time in Ramadan. And even, you know, when it comes to thinking about who you're going to invite for iftar, my advice is don't overdo it. Just invite who you need to really invite, but don't go crazy in doing if, iftar invitations because really, like, look, what is the purpose of iftar anyway, mainly in Ramadan? It's to feed the fasting so you get the ajr, isn't it? And also to keep Siddur Rahim, like to maintain the blood ties, of course. But in general, you don't want to overdo it with your iftar invitations. It's The honest truth is how many days are wasted because when we have an iftar invitation, we have very little time to do any ibadah in that particular day. So as much as you can get out of those iftar invitations, just so you can focus on your on your on on, on your on Ram- what Ramadan is really about. And this and another thing also as well here is the is the Eid shopping. Especially if you're the type that wants to get new clothes for every single kid in your family and you have 10 children. My advice is, as I said, you've got a week and two days or three days. It's probably cheaper to get the clothes now than it will be after when it's Ramadan. So quickly go out, hit the shops and get those clothes now. So you save all that time and frustration at the end of Ramadan looking for all those clothes and matching shoes and all of, all of that what you know, people do. Um, and look, at the end of the day, let's be honest, kids do not need to wear new clothes. They just need to wear good clothes. They don't need to wear new clothes. So if they've got some clothes that still fit them from a previous year or a wedding they've just gone to, that would be great for Ramadan, for Eid, inshallah. <clears throat> Another thing you can do is you can do meal planning. A lot of sisters find meal planning very beneficial. So if you can plan ahead what meals you want to have, you know, if you can get the shopping done for those meals beforehand, stock up your freezer. So everything's done because as well, we want to reduce going out of the house as much as possible. And that includes shopping. How much time do we waste shopping? So if we can get our, most of our major shopping done before Ramadan, then it's just a matter of going and getting the small, simple things we need to get that adds on to the extras that we need. So those are some of the things we should be focusing on. You know, before Ramadan, as I said, the aim is try to think about anything you can do to free up extra time for yourself in Ramadan. The next point is, my dearest sisters, to simplify your Ramadan as much as possible. So what do I mean by that? I mean, try to make it as easy as possible on yourself. Do not overload yourself in Ramadan. In fact, I want you to really just step back and try to calm down with all the things, all the the burdens you tend to place on yourself, the extra pressure you place on yourself. Normally it's women, we ourselves are the ones who place all the pressure on ourselves. Most of the time, it's not the husbands, it's actually ourselves. We think we have to do this and we have to do that. Ramadan is a time for us, like I said, sisters, take a holiday from this dunya. Take a holiday from this dunya, slow down, and try to enjoy this time and focus on your ibadah because it's so important for us to replenish our souls. We need to, you know, really slow down and take this time out to replenish our souls, you know, our soul sisters. How many of us are struggling in trying to maintain our iman in these times? How many of us are suffering from stress-related problems, whether anxiety or depression, all of these things? All of this is a sign that we need to slow down and start to nourish, give our time, ourselves the time to you know, enjoy ibadah, feel the halawa of the ibadah, feel the sweetness of the ibadah, my dearest sisters. So that's what your focus should be. So you know, as we always say, Ramadan is not the month of, of food and preparing food, which it comes for so many people. Ramadan is a, is a time of feeding your soul. You're fasting from food, but the idea is to feed your soul, not feed your stomach. So let's talk about how we can simplify our Ramadan for ourselves. Let's simplify, first of all, our food. We don't need to have 10 dishes on the table. We're not going through a famine. We're fasting Ramadan. You know, like, okay, the first day you might feel a bit hungry, but by the third day, you, don't, you, can, hardly, you can hardly feel your stomach because it's shrunk. So you really only, like for the family, you honestly only really need one dish. We don't need to do more than one dish. Okay? We've got to really change this mentality. Like look at, subhanAllah, may Allah subhanahu protect our health. A lot of us are studying, you know, a lot of the community suffers from health problems, from overeating. 
So if we can learn to eat like the sunnah, which is to fill the stomach only one third and to drink, you know, the rest of the, the, the stomach, is the next third is for, for your drink and the last third is, to, you know, to breathe. You know, if we were to follow the sunnah, we wouldn't be having to spend all this time in the kitchen to prepare all these foods because we honestly do not need it all. I mean, they say you need to eat about that much, as much as your fist. That's as big as your stomach is. But we're overstretching our stomachs, subhanAllah. So if we're cooking for that much each person, it's really not a lot of food. Another thing is to try to cook for two days. You know, well, some husbands are fussy, but inshallah your husband isn't. So if you can cook for two days, that is ideal because then you only have to cook for what? Like you cook once and then the next day, the whole day, you just got to recite Quran, do whatever ibadah you want to do, and you don't have to worry about preparing the food. All you have to do is heat it up, put your thought, and that's it. So try to do that as well. So that's your, with your cooking. Then besides that, your routine. You need to try to cut corners with your routine. There's a lot of extra things we place in ourselves we don't really need to do. For example, you don't need to polish your TV every single day. You don't need to polish every single piece of furniture in your house every single day. You don't need to scrub the bathroom down every single day. You know, some of us, we go crazy with our cleaning. We've got OCD. So let's all just calm down and realize we need to just step back, slow down, and start to give to ourselves in Ramadan. That should be our main focus, all right? We can always go and back to scrubbing the bathroom every day after Ramadan, but how about Ramadan, we just, you know, we can, you know, it's not gonna harm us if we have a few bits of dust lying around. We're not, nothing's gonna happen, inshallah. So just try to cut corners as much as you can. Things that you don't really need to do, you know, don't do it. Don't put that burden on yourself. You don't need to bath every single kid every single night. Kids do not get that dirty, sisters. Your kids are not playing in the dirt 24-7. They're not that dirty. So they don't need to be bathed every single day. Okay, sisters? So just whatever you can do to cut back for yourself, that's what you should be doing. To make yourself feel more at peace. In Ramadan, instead of feeling the stress that many people are feeling. So my, my advice, my dear sisters, is to stop trying to be a martyr, you know, and doing everything yourself. This is another big mistake many sisters do. They try to be the martyr. And then they want everyone to appreciate them and no one does because it's all hidden work that no one sees, right? Except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course. But in general, you know, you've been a martyr all day and you're waiting for your husband to come and say, oh, jazakillah khair for doing that. And he doesn't say anything and you feel resentful because he doesn't notice what you've done. All right? So my advice, my dearest sisters, is to have a whole new approach in Ramadan. That you're going to start delegating your tasks out to family members. Okay? Everybody can help you in cleaning the house. Everybody can help you in cooking the food. Start delegating. When they complain, you tell them the ayah. Cooperate in bir and taqwa. Cooperate in piety and fearing Allah. When we help each other in Ramadan, we're helping each other to have more time for ibadah. When everybody puts their hand in, it makes it that makes the work quicker and we all get more time ultimately. So and we should be helping each other to be, to strive in Ramadan, so you know, it should, the burden should not be displaced only on one person. And we ourselves, it's also a lot of the time our own fault because we don't ask. We don't ask others to help and to, to tell them that we need this help. You know, so if you're struggling in the expectations, like sometimes there are some husbands, they put a lot of expectations on their wives in Ramadan. So that's fine. He wants to place those expectations, but you need help. You need help. Explain to him how much you need to take this time out for yourself and to have free time in Ramadan to be able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you need his help to be able to do that. So can he suggest for you some ways that he can help you if he wants to place all these extra expectations on you? Is there anyone in his family who can help you? Is there, any, is there anyone in your family that can help you? Have a look around and see who might be able to help you in, in doing, like maybe you can go to someone's house and, house and help them cook the, the food for one iftar and then they come to your house and you cook the food together for the next iftar. If you've got to do a family thing, you know, sometimes some families, it's like your family one night and then everyone goes to the next family. If, if a couple of you, you know, the ones who are going to be doing that, if they can get together and cook together, you could probably finish the dinner in like one hour together. Rather than you're all day and all night 
you know, staying up all night cooking and all morning cooking and then they come and you're exhausted. So look for different ways that you can cut corners and like I said, try to delegate whatever tasks you have so that you don't feel resentful and really we should all be trying to help each other in striving for Ramadan, okay? Ramadan's not yani. This is a time for ihsan. This is a time for goodness to others and getting the rewards. So we should all be looking for those rewards in helping each other, inshallah, in striving for the akhirah. Another point is that we need to, the third point I want to speak about is we need to get rid of the time wasters. Because, you know, many of us, we complain that we don't have enough time. That's a very common complaint that many sisters make. I don't have enough time. But let's have a look at what you do with your time. If we have a really close look at what you do with your time, like how much time do we spend on social media? Even if you just spend one or two hours a day, just say you spend two hours a day on social media when you add it all up, how many times you check your Facebook page? If you spend, you know, like, a, a, you know, say quarter of an hour in the morning, quarter of an hour in the middle of the day, quarter, it all adds up to say two hours, then times that by seven days, that's 14 hours. 14 hours is a whole day. It's, it's more than a whole day of daylight, you know, that we could have been doing so much. So sometimes we're saying, I'm so busy, I don't have time. But in reality, it's because we don't make use of our time in a more beneficial way. And that's the reason we have so much, you know, we don't have enough time. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is too, like, like I was saying before, to cut back on going out of the house. As much as you can, Ramadan, as is, if possible, try to stay home as much as you can, Ramadan, to keep that time for yourself, you know? So don't, don't focus on going shopping in Ramadan. Shopping takes so much time out of your, your schedule, like I was saying before. And another thing as well is Ramadan is not the time for sitting watching TV series or watching, you know, Musa Salat, you know? And a lot of people waste a lot of time with that. That's fine outside Ramadan, to have a bit of, a bit of you know, recreation. But when it's Ramadan, Ramadan is not a time for watching TV series. Now, I know a lot of people are watching, for example, that series right now, um, Utu, um, Utu Grul, I can't say the word, you know, that Turkish series, SubhanAllah. But look, sisters, as much as Alhamdulillah, it's got some good, you know, beneficial things in it, but it's not, it's not for Ramadan. It's not for Ramadan. So put a pause on it, you know, watch the next few episodes as much as you can before Ramadan comes and look forward to after Ramadan. But, you know, I tell you, in my family, we've always had the policy that Ramadan, the TV does not even get turned on once. That's how it is for us. Like, it's just not the time. You know, you, you've got to put a pause on the dunya. Ramadan, you've got to put a pause on the dunya sisters. You've got to block it out to really get the benefit of Ramadan. The other thing that we can waste time on as well in Ramadan is socialising. Now, okay, you do need to always, you've got to, you've got to see human beings every now and again. But look, ultimately, sisters, I suggest to you that during the days you don't, you don't mix with people and go to their houses and just sit around and, and socialise. It's not the time for socialising in Ramadan. But, you know, try to limit your socialising to, say, when you go to an iftar, when you go to someone's house for iftar, but even then, don't overdo it with the socialising. You know, you need to put your priorities in order of what, you, what, you, what, you're, what you're planning for Ramadan, as I'll come to speak about. But you don't want to be spending all night socialising. You've got to have that time also for your tarawih prayers, as we'll come to. But besides that, um, your, your, your socialising can also be in the form of when you come for tarawih, you know, you come for tarawih, you talk to the sisters who are there in the masjid a little bit, like, for example, before the prayer or after the prayer, and just that human contact, it, it takes that need away for you, from you, for, from feeling that you need to have, you know, to see people during Ramadan. Another thing I do as well, of course, I have my classes as well. So obviously coming to lessons, but at least you're coming with the intention of coming to a lesson, and, and, but you're connecting with others through that. So, you know, you're, you're coming for the sake of Allah together to learn what's khayr for you in this life and in the, and in the akhirah. But at the same time, you're still getting that human, you know, interaction. So if you're going to socialize, like I said, try to do it in the ways that it's not just waste, it's not time wasting. And if you look at the Salaf sisters anyway, in Ramadan, you know, you see a lot of them, they used to actually stick to the masjid when they were fasting. Because, and when they were asked why, they said they feared mixing with people because once you mix with people, it's very likely you're going to fall into, say, backbiting, gossiping, 
things that reduce the reward for your fasting. So that's why, dear sisters, as much as possible, avoid socialising too much in Ramadan, especially during the day when you're fasting, because you, you can easily reduce your reward in one minute. You know how easy it is for sisters to suddenly start gossiping about someone backbiting or just talking about dunya, things that don't benefit. And subhanAllah, like, sometimes you can feel so motivated for Ramadan and such an, on such a high in, your, in what you're doing, and because you went and mixed with certain people and they just start talking about all this stuff, you come back and you kind of lose your motivation. So that's why it's better to not mix too much in Ramadan, inshallah. The next point, sisters, that I have is <clears throat> to plan, you know, plan for quality over quantity. Plan for quality over quantity when you're busy. That's what you have to focus on. Like if we look at what Allah Ta'ala tells us in the Quran anyway, He says in Surah Mulk, so Allah Ta'ala, He tells us in this verse that He's the one who created both death and life to test you, which one of you is what? Ahsanu amala, is best in deeds. He didn't say aktharu amala. He didn't say the most in deeds. He said the best. So that's why, my dearest sisters, especially when you're very busy, you need to focus on. You need to focus on an ikhlas, doing the small deeds that you can do with ikhlas. That is far better than somebody who does many, many, many deeds or huge deeds without ikhlas, without sincerity. So this should be your focus, that whatever you do, you try to aim for maximum ikhlas as much as possible. Sincerity for the sake of Allah, without riyah, without showing off, for the sake of Allah alone, and trying to reach an ihsan in everything you do. Trying to perfect everything you do. What, what, am I, what do I mean by that? I'm going to go through the different things we should be aiming towards perfect, per perfecting to the best of our abilities in Ramadan. And number one of those things which should be in our plan for, for trying to perfect is our salah, is our prayers. And trying to have ihsan in our prayers. We need to really slow down and start taking more, you know, more, more focus in our prayers, my dearest sisters. Like most of the year we spend, we pray, but we hardly remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our prayers. We're so busy, and that's why we don't get the benefit of the prayer. But we have to realize that we, in Ramadan, we should be trying to, you know, reach that higher level in our prayers, inshallah. As you know, what is ihsan in the prayer? What is ihsan? And ta'abud Allah ka'annaka tarahu fa innam takun tarahu fa innahu yara. To worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you can see him and even if you can't see him, then verily he sees you. This is the level we should be trying to reach in our prayers. So how are we going to achieve this, my dearest sisters? First of all, we have to learn to slow down in our prayers. We have to realize how much we're in need for our prayers. We are, why are we all suffering so much stress and all of these problems? Because subhanAllah, we're not really giving the prayer. Yani, we're not realizing how important the prayer is for us. And using it like a medicine for our souls. SubhanAllah. So how do you do that? Well, number one, you need to be focusing on trying to pray your prayers in the beginning of their times. In the beginning of their times. Because when you pray towards the end, that's when you're more likely going to rush. And you're not going to enjoy your prayer. But when you pray in the beginning, that's when you've got more time. You feel you're, you're more relaxed. You focus more. And anyway, subhanAllah, the reward for praying in the beginning is not like the reward for praying in the end. When the Prophet ﷺ was asked, what is the best of deeds, what did he say? He said, As-salatu ala waqtiha, the prayer in its time. So the prayer in the beginning of its time is far greater in reward. And what was I, what was I just saying to you a moment, again, a moment ago? I was saying to you that a lot of you are complaining because you're so busy, you hardly have enough time, and you're worried about how you can get the maxim how can you maximize your Ramadan? Look for those, try to, you know, whatever deeds you do, you try to maximize them. Whatever deeds you can do, you try to maximize them. How do you do that? Number one, ikhlas, like I said. 
And number two, trying to perfect them. Number two, trying to perfect them as much as you can. And doing them in the times where they're greater in reward. So that way, you, if you can only pray your fight prayer, you've maximized it by praying in the beginning or towards the be beginning of its time. I don't say you have to pray within the first five minutes, but, you know, first half an hour, maximum the first hour. Try not to delay your prayer longer than that because you don't get the taste. You don't get the same taste. And the other thing too, sisters, don't compare to others when it comes to your prayers. Like you might see some people, subhanAllah, they pray long, long, long prayers in Ramadan and you think you might think that's better to yourself. Allahu alam if that's better. Because a prayer with ikhlas and khushur, which might be shorter, where you get close to Allah in that prayer, is far better than a prayer where a person stands for long periods of time <clears throat> and all they're wishing is to get out of that prayer because they're so tired and they just want to get out of that prayer. You see? So think about think about qu quality over quantity. That's what I'm advising you, inshallah. And another thing here too, sisters, is focus, especially in your sajda. You know, when you're in the prostration to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remind yourself, this is the closest you can be in this dunya to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So make use of it by making lots of dua and calling upon Allah, pouring out your problems to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your sajda. This is what you should be doing in your sajda to get close to Allah. Make use of your sajda. Besides this, so besides trying to focus on our prayers, the other thing we should be trying to maximize as much as we can is our fasting. Okay, when we're busy, we, have, we can only focus on what we're able to fit in, but whatever we're able to fit in, and these, these are essentials. Obviously, praying five, ten, five times a day is non-negotiable. Okay, fast Ramadan, is non-negotiable. So those non-negotiables, we try to make sure we're doing them to the maximum of our ability, inshallah, to get the, the, the maximum reward for them. So we need, to, we need to try to perfect our fasting. A lot of people are under the impression that fasting is just one level, and they don't realize that fasting is many levels. People are on different levels in their fasting. So we want to try to reach the highest level of fasting. And the highest level of fasting is fasting with Ihsan. Fasting, as I said, and ta'bud Allah ka'anna katarahu fa'innam takun tarahu fa'innam yarak. Fasting as if you can see Allah and even if you can't see him, then verily know that he sees you. This is what we should be trying to aim at. That at every moment of my day, I've got that consciousness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching me in whatever I say. Watching me in whatever I do, watching me in whatever I look at, watching me in whatever I listen to, watching me in whatever I speak with my tongue. So if I can reach that level, I'm reaching the highest level of fasting, bi idnillahi ta'ala. And you know the Prophet wasallam, he told us about the reward for that person who fasts with sincerity for the sake of Allah. Man sama Ramadan, iman and wahti saman, ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dambi. Whoever fasted Ramadan with sincere iman, hoping for the reward from Allah, like their previous sins will be forgiven. So this is what we're aiming for in our fasting, inshallah. <clears throat> and the other thing, my dear sisters, you have to also know what is it that brings you close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anyway? What is it that brings you close to Allah? It's the fara'id first of all. Number one is the fara'id. Number one is the compulsory actions. As the Prophet tells us in a hadith Qudsi that Allah Ta'ala says, مَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِ بِشَيْءٍ حَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا افْتَرَبْتُهُ عَلَيْهِ My servant does not come near to me with anything which is more love to me than what I have made fad upon him, than what I have made obligatory upon him. وَلَا يَزَالُ عَبْدِ يَتَقَرَّبُ إِلَيَّ um, and my servant continues to draw close to me with the voluntary deeds until I love him and then what does he say in the rest of the hadith and when I love him I am the seeing with which he sees I am the hearing with which he hears I am you know, the, the hand with which he reaches and the, you know, the leg with which, you know, he walks, subhanAllah. So what does this mean? It means when you reach that high level, inshallah, ya Rabbi, may Allah bless us all with it, of wilaya, with Allah, 
with wilaya where you're under the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala due to your ihsan, then Allah ta'ala protects your eyes from what you look at. He protects your ears from what you listen to. He protects your tongue from what you say. He protects your hand from going to anything which is haram or your legs from taking you anywhere which is not pleasing to Allah Azza wa So this is the point we want to try to reach to, my dearest sisters. And so therefore you find yourself, alhamdulillah, you're always wanting to look at what is pleasing to Allah. So you love to look into the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and recite and memorize the Quran. And you love to, you know, recite the Quran and to say the dhikr of Allah and to make dua to Allah azza wa jal. And you love to listen to what is pleasing to Allah, such as listening to a lecture on, you know, seeking knowledge or getting close to Allah. And when you, and you, same with where you walk to, where do you go? You go to the masjid, you go to lessons, you go to halaqat al-Quran. So this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is protecting you, He's making you live your life. That your whole life is for Allah, inshallah. This is, should be our ultimate aim. But in Ramadan, we try to practice this lifestyle so that inshallah it becomes a lifestyle for us all times of the year, not just in Ramadan. The other thing, my dearest sisters, when it comes to perfecting our fasting is our ihsan with others as well. Our ihsan with others, which is the good treatment of others. Like that we should be trying to focus on improving our, our ikhlaq, akhlaq in Ramadan with everybody, with our children, with our husbands, with our mothers, with our fathers. We try to focus on having a more beautiful akhlaq with those around us and realize Realize the high level of reward for the good akhlaq. So you might not be able to do many deeds, sisters, because you're so busy with your kids or so busy with your household duties, but you can always, you can always try to improve your akhlaq by smiling more at your husband, by smiling more at your children. Sometimes we forget to smile. If you start taking it more easy on yourselves, my dearest sisters, I guarantee you'll be able to smile more. But you're putting too much pressure on yourselves. Start taking off the pressure and you'll find the smile starts slowly drifting upwards. Even in that. And remember what the Prophet ﷺ, he said, what is the one, you know, what is the main thing that people will enter the Jannah through? Taqwallah wa husnil khuluq. The fear of Allah and having the beautiful character. So this is something we really want to try and focus on as much as possible. We should become better in Ramadan, my dearest sisters, not worse. A lot of people in Ramadan, sat, you know, because you, you know, you're feeling tired, you're feeling hungry, you start to become a bit of a monster. You know, maybe you start screaming at people, arguing more, screaming at the kids. You know, so as I said, if you try to just step back and, 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 and realize what Ramadan's about, you're trying to perfect your fasting, you're trying to reach ihsan in your fasting, and if you feel really upset, you're starting to get upset, Say to the person, Inni sa'ima, Inni sa'ima, like I'm fasting, I'm fasting, take it easy on me. I ask Allah to make it easy, on, that you make it easy on me. You know, say those kind of things to remind them to, to you know, to, to, to back off and just let you focus on your fasting. You know, as well, you know, the husbands, they always love to just try to, you know, argue with you in Ramadan. It's always that day where they're going to try and provoke you and get you into a fight. Sometimes some husbands, they love to argue. It's just like something they enjoy. You know, so, you know, when that happens, just step back and realize, you know what? I'm not going to let anyone, inshallah, destroy my, my rewards for this day. I've worked hard for this day. You know, just tell him, look, I'm fasting, inshallah, I'll talk to you about this after Maghrib. The other thing, sisters, is try to prioritize your deeds. Like when you're really, when you're really busy, you don't really have a lot of time to squeeze in to do a lot of deeds. So what do you have to do in that case? Then you have to make you have to make the most of doing as many of the deeds that maximize your rewards and also the times in which your your deeds are maximized. So I'm going to explain that a little bit. So for example, there are certain types of dhikr that bring greater reward than others. An example of this is once, for example, Juwayriya, radiallahu anha was was, you know, she, after Fajr, she stayed sitting, remembering Allah Azza wa Jal. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went out, and she was sitting, remembering Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And then when he came back towards, you know, towards the Duhr time, she was still sitting there, remembering Allah. 
And so, subhanAllah, the Prophet وسلم, told her, you know, I have said four phrases that's equal to all that you said in this time. And he said, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, wa bihamdihi, wa wa These four phrases is equal to everything that you have said. So if we can say these, like that's, that's from the du'as we say in the morning and evening. You say it three times. You can, look at, you can find the du'a in the fortress of a Muslim. All right, sisters, but so if you don't have time, surely when you're driving the kids to school, surely when you're just sitting after Fajr prayer, you can say, you can say these, these four lines, you can look in your du'a book to read them, and subhanAllah, that's equal to as if you had sat from after Fajr all the way to almost Dhuhr in, in remembering Allah and making dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you understand? And the same thing with Sud al-Ikhlas. There are some, you know, there are some, uh, you know, narrations. For example, there's a narration that mentions if you say Sud al-Ikhlas, recite it, you know, ten times, Allah ta'ala will build for you a house in Al-Jannah. And if you recite Sud al-Ikhlas, it's like, it's equal to one third of the Quran. So if you recite it three times, you get the reward as if you recited, you know, recited the Quran, yani the whole Quran. So there are there are many deeds which we can do to maximize our reward as much as we can. If we're very busy, we just try to fit these things into our, our routine. Then besides that, we've also got times which are greater, which we should pay more attention to. For example, the last third of the night. You know, we know that this is the time when Allah Ta'ala descends in a manner that befits His majesty and perfection and answers the dua of those who call upon Him. The last, you know, the last hour on Friday as well. We should make, make the most of these times. And then especially the last 10 nights of Ramadan. You know, we should be focusing on these, and especially in the odd nights and especially trying to get the al Qadr. So, we, you know, those are things which we, can, we cannot neglect, you know. Like, you, you might take an easy pace with yourself in the beginning of Ramadan, but you should be slowly trying to work yourself up towards the last 10 days. The last 10 days is when you really give it your all, inshallah. So when you don't have much time, that's what you do. Take it easy on yourself the first, first 10 days. Even the first 20 days, it's all right. It's all right. Go on a moderate pace. As if you're running a race. Just go on the moderate pace that you're able to do with, you know, make, but don't make it hard on yourself. Make it flexible, your routine. But then in your last 10 days, you try your, your best to maximize as much as you can, inshallah. Okay, now we come to the next point, which is to set achievable goals for yourself. It's important that before we go into Ramadan, we've already got a visual image of what we're hoping to achieve. And this comes down to two things. The first one is having a daily plan. You should have an, an idea of what you, how is your schedule going to look like each day. What's your daily schedule going to look like for you according to your circumstances? And then the second part of that is what are the main things that you want to achieve in the whole month of Ramadan? Like as, as an, as a, you know, overall, what are, the, what are the main deeds that you would like to have when you leave Ramadan that you've, you've done these particular deeds. Okay, so I'm going to talk about those. So, first of all, for your daily plan, your daily plan, everybody's daily plan, should be that they want to aim towards praying all their five prayers on time. So even for those people who struggle with praying Fajr on time, Ramadan should be a time when most of us, you know, hopefully 99% of us, we don't struggle with praying Fajr on time because... If you don't wake up for, the good thing about when you don't wake up for Fajr in, in Ramadan is that you suffer the consequences of not having suhoor and so you have to go the, day, the whole day hungry and so you should remind yourself that if I wake up for suhoor, I could have even had something to eat and I could have prayed my Fajr prayer on time. You see, so the suhoor actually helps you to get regulate yourself and get yourself used to praying your Fajr prayer on time. So that your goal, daily goal, your you know, your daily plan should be, you know, basically revolving around your five prayers. So when you're thinking about how to do a daily plan, you, you know, if, you've, if you do a daily planner for yourself, some people do that, you slot in your day, you know, when am I going to be praying? I need to, that's a priority. I put those first. So for example, if I want to cook something, 
I can get it started, but, but, but I know that I do it before, for example, 12, because I know that around 12 I, I need to go pray. Or, you know, the kids, the, the baby, you know, I know that he goes to sleep at, um, I don't know, maybe he's going to wake up at quarter past 12 or something like that. So you say to yourself, I know he's going to wake up at quarter to 12, quarter past 12, he's going to need a breastfeed. So therefore I need to have my wudu before 12 so that I can pray my duha prayer, you know, before he wakes up. So you've got to think about your own schedule and how you're going to schedule the kids around, you know, and everything else you're going to do around your five prayers. You know, even you might say to yourself, all right, look, every, every, you know, day in the middle of the day, because I know it's time for duha, I'm going to... Um, Make that the lunch time for the kids. You know, put them somewhere where they're you know safe, and give them something they like to eat. And then you quickly run away and go get wudu and pray your your little prayer while they're in the beginning of their food. Usually, like something they like, even if if if, if it comes down to that, where you you've got no choice except to give them say some cheesels or something that's going to make them sit there and maybe be quiet while they put the cheesels on their on their fingers, you know, like rings. But they'll be doing that and you'll be able to pray with, you know, you'll actually enjoy your um, duh prayer because, you know, they're so entertained with what they're doing. So you've got, to, you've got to be a little bit imaginative if you want to find time to actually enjoy your prayer. But you've got to think ahead. It needs pre-planning. Okay, so that's what you should be trying to do. Then the other thing is you need to think about when are you going to be reading your Qur'an every day. Because usually we're so busy, days go by we don't read, we don't recite. So there should be a time, you think about your own routine. Is it going to be after Fajr, before everybody wakes up? Is it going to be after you drop the kids to school? Or is it going to be before you go to sleep? But you need to know that that's a time that you're going to stick to it. You never compromise that time. Or it could be after every Fad prayer that you have your Mus'haf next to your where you pray and then every time you, you, you pray your Fad prayer and after you finish doing your dhikr, you, 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 you reach out, you get your Mus'haf and you start to recite from the Qur'an even 15-20 minutes and you've done some Qur'an and that adds up. Those 15-20 minutes after every Fad prayer, that adds up, doesn't it? And you, you, could, you could read quite a lot by the end of that day. Then another thing for a daily plan is if we, we, we would hope to try to be praying all of the 12 rawatib prayers, which are the prayers that are attached to the Fad prayers. So the two before Fajr, the, um, the four rakat before Dhuhr, and the two after Dhuhr, and the two after al and even the two after al -Ishat. So we try to make that part of our daily plan as well, that we try to achieve that because we know that whoever prays these 12 prayers, Allah Ta'ala will build a house for them in our Jannah if you're as consistent with this, inshallah. So we try to make that part of our habits for Ramadan. Besides that, dear sisters, you've got the Tarawih prayers. So either you're going to go to the mosque and pray Tarawih. Now, just so you know, Alhamdulillah, usually every year here in Masjid al Azhar, we have babysitting available in Ramadan, in Tarawih. So the sisters can come and pray and they can put their kids in the childcare. But if you um, pray at home, you know, just because you don't come for Tarawih doesn't mean you can't pray at home. A lot of people think you either go to the mosque and pray Tarawih or you pray nothing at home. No, get up and pray as many rakat as you can at home and that's your Tarawih, you know. Um, and, you know, the, the reward for Tarawih, you know, that's why you don't want to miss it in Ramadan. The reward for praying, you know, during the nights of Ramadan, as the, the Prophet sallallahu told us, "Man qama Ramadan iman wahtisaban, ghufira lahu ma taqadam min dambi." Whoever stood during the nights of Ramadan out of sincere iman and hoping for the reward from Allah, then Allah will forgive their previous sins. So something we don't want to miss. Even if you're so tired and you can't pray eight rakats. Even if you just pray four, you know, pray two and then pray two, maybe you can set the alarm and wake up and pray the rest, you know, before, before you have your support in the morning if you're so tired. Don't think you have to pray Tarawih in the beginning of the night, my dear sisters. Tarawih just means Qiyam al layl Tarawih means Qiyam al layl okay? It means the night prayer. If you're, it's not restricted to only praying in the beginning of the night. You can pray in the beginning of the night. You can pray in the middle of the night. You can pray at the end of the night. So you can be flexible with it. So that's our daily plan we're trying to aim towards. Of course, our morning and evening supplications as well. Our, our card of the morning and evenings, try to do at least some if you can't do all. 
you've got the prayer book, the fortress of a Muslim, so you get it out. I mean, put it next to your prayer place so that you don't forget to say it after you, you, you pray, inshallah, in the Fajr prayer. And you've got all morning, even if you, you, you missed out, take it with you when you drop the kids to school, maybe sit in the car for a bit and, and read them while you're in the car as you drop the kids to school, you know? Or, you know, after us, you're going to take them to Quran class or something. You can, you can be reading them in the car while you're waiting for them to come out from, from their Quran class or their karate class or wherever you have to take them, you know? We've got to, we've got to try to implement as much ibadah into our routine as we can. Let's get on to talking about our basic plan for the month. So when we look at the whole month of Ramadan, what are the things that when, when we think about how, you know, how am I going to make this Ramadan something that I remember, a memorable Ramadan that I really feel impacts, has impacted upon me. Okay, so there's certain things we would like to achieve, inshallah, to walk away from Ramadan feeling that you really did your best in this month and it really had an impact on you, inshallah. So, of course, number one would be to pray tarawih every night. As much as possible, we, we, do, we try to miss our tarawih prayers, like I already gave you the outline on that. And then, to finish, like if you are fluent in reciting Arabic, then there's no excuse for you not to finish the whole Quran reciting once, at least. Others, you know, you, you, you have to set your own goal for yourself. Maybe you're not very fluent in reading Arabic, so maybe you set for yourself reading, for example, Juzamma, the last section of the Quran. That's your goal for Ramadan. Everybody has to set their own goals according to what their ability is. Maybe you don't know Arabic yet, so you'll just be reading the translation. You try to read as much as a translation, but you set a goal of what you think is achievable before Ramadan comes. Then another thing is... Ideally, we'd like to have fed some fasting Muslims in this month. Now, that can be done, like we said before, either by inviting people for iftar or send, cooking food and sending to fasting people, leaving food in the mosque or sending, you know, sending food to the mosque or giving sadaqah for those associations that feed the fasting. That's one of the easiest ways. You give money to those people who are collecting to feed the, the hungry in, in refugee camps or in poor countries where you're feeding your Muslim brothers and sisters and you're getting the reward of their fast without reducing from their fast. And that's one of the easiest ways, inshallah, to gain great rewards. Imagine you're fasting your day and you're getting all these people, you're getting all their reward for their fasting, subhanAllah, while you're just, you know, you're not even doing the efforts, subhanAllah. The other thing we would like to aim towards, my dearest sisters, is try to think about some secret good deeds that you can do in this month that's just between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know that from, from two of the seven who will be under the shade of, of the throne of Allah on Yom Qiyamah, on the day when there's no shade except for the shade of Allah, is that person who sat alone and remembered Allah and so tears came down from their eyes. And that person who gave so secretly with their right hand that even their left hand did not know about it to that level. Yani, what it means is that those two deeds in particular are deeds of great ikhlas. That's why they got such a great reward because no one knew about that deed except for Allah. So... That's why, you know, if possible, try to not let Ramadan go, except that at least once, if not more, at least once, there's a time when you sat alone, no one was around you, and you, you cried for the sake of Allah. You cried out of love for Allah, fear for Allah, making dua to Allah, making tawbah to Allah, repenting to Allah. You know, you'll, you'll see the difference in yourself if you're able to achieve that in Ramadan, inshallah. And then besides that, Besides that as well is sadaqah. Try to give some sadaqah which is secret that nobody knows about it so that inshallah hopefully you can be from amongst these seven who will be given the shade on the day when there's no shade except for the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then of course Ramadan wouldn't be Ramadan unless we seek out Laylul Qadr. Unless we seek out Laylul Qadr. Especially now if we're weak and it's difficult, we've got babies, we've got to wake up or not, we're exhausted. We aim for the odd nights, you know, especially the last odd nights, like the 25th in particular, the 27th and the 29th in particular, those nights, you exert more effort, especially, and especially the 27th, 
exert your, your maximum effort in this night. Even if you can't pray or fast, don't think that you should just go to sleep. Oh, I can't pray and fast, so I'll just go to sleep. No. This, is, this, this could be Dayl Qadr when your previous sins could be forgiven. So, and Aisha, radiallahu anha, she mentions that the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to ahl al which means ahl al He used to, he used to um, make the night alive with worship. So it's not restricted to only praying. You can recite the Quran without touching the Arabic Mus'haf. You can make a lot of dhikr in this night. You can make dua to Allah. You can make tawbah. You can repent to Allah. There's so much you can be doing in Lail Qadr. Give sadaqah. Now we have PayPal. We can send to any charity organization, even if it's 1 o'clock in the morning. Give sadaqah anywhere, subhanAllah. You know what I mean? So there's so much you can be doing in, in the night that, you know, inshallah, you're seeking Lail Qadr. So these, if we try to focus on doing this in our month, you, inshallah, will leave Ramadan feeling like satisfied that you really got the most out of this month. That's what we should be trying to achieve. Number six is to, you know, make your intention to live your days and nights lillah, for the sake of Allah. That should be your ultimate aim in Ramadan. As I said, we're trying to reach that level of ihsan. And look at the ayah in the Quran. Allah Ta'ala says... قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ So Allah Ta'ala says قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Say verily, my salah, my, my prayer, and my sacrifice, and my living and my dying is for Allah alone. And that should be our... That should be our whole aim in life. Our whole aim in life should be lillah, for Allah. And so when you wake up in the morning, dear sisters, with that aim, subhanAllah, your whole life takes on a whole different color. It takes on a whole different color when you're living lillah. Even when it comes to washing, doing boring things like washing dishes, like doing housework, everything takes on a whole new purpose, a, a higher purpose. You know, your whole life takes on a higher purpose in life, subhanAllah. You start to actually weirdly enjoy things that other people find mundane because you're doing it for Allah. And you know that Allah says, <laughs> That verily Allah does not waste the reward of the, those who do good. He doesn't waste what you do. Your husband may not say, Jazakallah khair. Your husband might not appreciate it. Maybe your kids don't appreciate the food you cook. But Allah sees what you do when you do it with ihsan and you do it with the intention to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So like I'm saying, in Ramadan in particular, wake up and make your intention to live this day for the sake of Allah. That everything you do, you're going to do it for the, for the pleasure of Allah. Inshallah. And when you go to bed at night as well, you're sleeping for the sake of Allah. So you mention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before you sleep. If we live our life like this, you'll, feel, you'll taste the halawa of life. You'll taste the sweetness of life, subhanAllah. Another, another very important um, tip that a lot of people don't know about, and that is how the ulama have mentioned that you can turn even everyday habits into ibadah through your intention. Okay, you can change your everyday habits into an act of ibadah through your intention. Okay, so if you know that, then try in especially Ramadan to say Bismillah before you do everything. Whatever it is, like you've got a vacuum, Bismillah. You've got to put the clothes out on the clothesline, Bismillah. Mind you, I already told you, you delegate the clothes to someone else to put on the clothesline, right? But if you have to, say Bismillah, Allah Ta'ala, He puts barakah in whatever you do. Because you're, when you say Bismillah, you're seeking the help of Allah with His name. You're seeking the help of Allah with His name. So you're actually... Asking for barakah in everything that you do. And Allah will place barakah and He'll make it easy for you, inshallah. That's one thing. So try to, you know, whatever deeds you have to do, try to change them into acts of worship for yourself by your intention. 
Then the other thing is, two sisters, is you try to move from the state of one good deed to the next. So, for example, when I finish reciting my Quran in the morning, revising Quran in the morning, then I, my next intention is to clean the house for the sake of Allah, for example, for my family. And then after that, my next intention is to go and pray for the sake of Allah or to drop the kids for the sake of Allah or whatever I'm going to do. I, I try to move from the state of one state of obedience to the next. Or maybe, you know, or, you know after I pray tarawih, I might think, what am I going to do now? I feel bored. So what am I going to do? I'm going to turn on YouTube and I'm going to listen to some lectures about Ramadan or some motivational lectures to remind me of Allah in the next life, you know? So basically what you try and do is to move from one state of, you know, where you're getting rewards to the next. And that's why what you should be doing throughout the day night Ramadan, especially the days, is, you know, stop and ask yourself, is what I'm doing right now um, something that's going to bring me ajr, it's going to bring me thawab, or is this something I could be doing which is more beneficial right now with my time? Okay, so just keep on asking yourself that question. It will help you to maintain your focus. The other thing, the other trick as well, the other, the other tip, because you're very busy, you haven't got much time to sit and enjoy your ibadah maybe. So what you have to do is to learn to incorporate ibadah into your routine. What do I mean by that? I mean... Like, for example, dhikr of Allah, doing a lot of dhikr of Allah, doing a lot of, you know, istighfar, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Like, these things are so easy to do, you, you know, you could be doing anything and saying it. Like, you could be, um, you know, driving the kids to school and saying astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, you know. You could be cooking the food for the family and saying, la ilaha illallah. Like, you know, and repeating these, um, repeating these as card over and over again. So these vicar sisters, they're so light on the tongue, but they're so heavy in the mizan. And you know, subhanAllah, I'll tell you something that a lot of people don't know. I'm going to share something with you today, subhanAllah. Something that Ibn Qayyim, rahimallah, he mentions. He says, Rahimallah, he says, أَفْطَلُوا أَهْلِ كُلِّ عَمَلٍ أَكْثَرُهُمْ فِيهِ ذِكْرًا لِلَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ So he says, the best of people who do any act in Islam, or any act to be bad in Islam, are the ones who mention Allah the most when they're doing that act. So he says, فَأَفْطَلُوا الصَّوَّامِ أَكْثَرُهُمْ ذِكْرًا لِلَّهِ so he says, and the ones who are best in their fasting are the ones who remember Allah the most. So remembering Allah a lot when you're fasting, mentioning Allah a lot in your fasting, that takes the level of your fasting to a higher level, higher than others who are not remembering Allah while they're fasting. And actually, it's the same when you do hajj. The more you remember Allah in your hajj, your hajj is of a higher reward and level than those who go to hajj and they don't remember Allah very much. So keep that in your mind as well. And how simple is that? Dhikr is something we can all do. No matter how busy we are, we can take the benefit of, you know, filling our days and nights with the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, the best dhikr of Allah is the Qur'an. If you've memorized the Qur'an and you're able to revise it while you're driving, then of course, the words of Allah ta'ala is, is the greatest of dhikr. Then besides that, we're talking about incorporating Ibadah, into our routine, you've got all these du'as from the sunnah that the Prophet ﷺ has taught us that so many people overlook. Like the du'a before you go in the bathroom, or the du'a before you go to the bathroom, or the du'a when you leave your house, or the du'a when you enter your house, or the du'a before you eat, or the du'a before you drive your car. All of these du'a sisters, people don't realise they add up over time. How great is the reward of that sister who every time she does an act and is a sunnah dua for it, that she has said that dua every single day, that adds up over time. How great is her reward compared to the one who doesn't remember these, doesn't say these duas in everything that they, they do. SubhanAllah. So you have to keep that in your mind. Try to implement these duas, learn them off by heart and make them you know, incorporate them into your life because that was the life of the Prophet He spent his whole life remembering Allah at all times and places. 
Besides that, my dear sisters, make use of those times which we can call like your pockets in time. You know, where you might be waiting for a train, you might be seeing a doctor's surgery waiting for an appointment. A lot of sisters waste those times. They sit there talking, they sit there going on their phone, looking on Facebook, you know. In Ramadan in particular, sisters, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be taking your, you know, you, hopefully on your phone you've got the app, the Quran app, or you bring your little copy of the Mus'haf, you're reciting Quran while you're waiting in that appointment, you know, you're waiting for the train, you take out your Quran, or you're doing zikr of Allah, or dua, you know, you try to make the most of that, those pockets in time, waiting for the kids to come out from school, you know, all those times, use those little pockets of time, everybody's got those pockets of time in their day. And then, you know, even when you go to the shops, I mean, subhanAllah, there are some, there's a particular dua to say before you go to the shop that has such a huge reward for it. When bef- and, and, and subhanAllah, what is the reason why it's such a huge reward? Majority of people, when they go, to, when they go shopping, they don't remember Allah. Because the shop, going to shopping, you're just thinking about dunya. So only the person whose heart is connected with Allah will remember to mention Allah and say this dua before they go shopping. And subhanAllah says, if you say this dua, inshallah Allah will protect you from the shaitan, putting, you know, uh, how can I say, false desires in your heart that you feel like you've got to buy this and you've got to buy that and you don't really need to buy it. You know? So that dua, la ilaha illallahu wahtuhu la sharika lah, lahu al-mulk wa lahu al-hamt, yuhyi wa yumit, wa huwa hayyum la yumimut, bi yadihi al-khayr, wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. There's a, there's a hadith that mentions whoever says this has a million hasana and they get a million say at a million sins forgiven for them. SubhanAllah. Just from saying this dua before you go to the shops. Okay, so that's some of the ideas that you can do in your day to make use of your, you know, to really maximize your Ramadan, inshallah. Coming towards the end now of our talk, I know it's been quite long, but I had a lot that I wanted to, to share with you, inshallah. So, there's one realization we need to all come to, and that is this. You can have the best time management in the world, my dearest sisters. You can have, like, you can be the person that has your planner, and you know, you write out what you're going to do every day and every week. But let me tell you one thing, and that is this that unless you have baraki in your life, then, subhanAllah, you'll not be able to achieve like others achieved. The reality is that Sheikh Al Islam, Ibn Taymiyyah, and all of these amazing ulama of the past, they didn't have those time planners, but what they had, they had the barakah of Allah. They had the barakah of the law of, of, of Allah in their lives. So realize that you know you can take the asbab by all means, you can plan what you want to do, but ultimately you need the help of Allah and you need his barakah in order to achieve great things in your life, inshallah. So what are some of the things I can do to increase the barakah? You know, of my day, of course, starting your day with the Quran, this puts barakah in your day. Starting the day, your day with Quran puts barakah in your day. Dhikr of Allah puts barakah in your day. Starting the day, your day with, you know, the adhkar, sabah, the, you know, the, the, the remembrances or supplications, the mornings. You're, you know, a lot of people say, I don't have time for Quran, and they don't realize that the Quran gives you time. The Quran blesses your time to give you more time, subhanAllah. So don't say you don't have time for Quran because when you start making time for the Quran, inshallah you'll get more time through that. Bi'idnillah. And the other thing you can obviously see is when you start off your day with these remembrances and filling your day with Quran, then that sets you on a on a very like it sets you on a positive path for the rest of the day. You know, you've already done something so positive in the beginning of the day, so it sets you on that trajectory, we could say, for the rest of the day, inshallah. And another thing that can bring barakah in your day as well, like we look at what did the Prophet ﷺ advise Fatima, radiallahu anha. You know, she was complaining because subhanAllah was very, she had a lot of hard work to do, her hands were becoming, you know, um, you know, maybe getting blisters and things like that because of how hard she was working and she went to the Prophet ﷺ and asked him for a servant and he said, shall I tell you what's better for you than a servant? And what did he tell her? He told her to say, subhanAllah, 33 times, 
um, Alhamdulillah 33 times and Allahu Akbar 34 times. And if that is better for you than a servant. So if you can remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before you go to sleep and to say this dhikr that the Prophet sallallahu advised Fatima, inshallah Allah, you'll find Allah will put barakah in your day. Bi'idnillahi ta'ala. And then besides that, as well, like I said before, saying Bismillah in whatever you have to do, remembering Allah and saying Bismillah, Allah helps you with what you have to do. Besides that, make dua for barakah. Make dua for barakah. There is a dua based upon the dua of Isa alayhi salam in the Quran where um, you can say, Allah ja'alni mubarakan aynama kunt. Oh Allah, make me mubarakah wherever I am. In a state of barakah, wherever I am. That whatever I'm doing, yani wherever I am, I'm always in a state of barakah where I'm getting the, you know, I'm getting rewards from Allah, I'm getting the forgiveness of Allah, I'm getting His pleasure in whatever I'm doing. I'm not wasting my time, I'm not spending my time in sins. So Allah is protecting me, inshallah. So this is another thing you can do to get barakah. Okay, let's finish up, inshallah. I want to say to you, sisters, that realize that we are all in different life stages. I'm going to tell you this as, you know, a sister in Islam who I've gone through different life stages myself, you know. So when you're single, before marriage, or when you're newly married, you have a lot of time on your hands. So your Ramadan, or, you know, when your kids have grown up as well, you have more time on your hands. So when you're, you know, when you have more time, you obviously have more time for your ibadah. You have more time for reading Quran and praying. So your Ramadan, the way it looks, it's a Ramadan of ibadah. It's a Ramadan of worship and getting close to Allah. This is what you can focus on. But as for that sister who's in a different life stage, where she has, you know, three or four or five young kids, you know, that I say to you, your Ramadan, inshallah, is a Ramadan of jihad. So don't try and compare to people who are having a Ramadan of ibadah while you're going through a stage of Ramadan of jihad, okay? Because you're in a Ramadan of striving. You're in the Ramadan of striving where you should be seeking the reward from Allah through your striving. Don't think that every Ramadan that the Prophet and the Sahaba went through was an easy going Ramadan. Three of the greatest, you know, three of the greatest battles were fought in Ramadan. The Battle of Badr, the Battle of Khandaq, and the Battle of Tabuk. So the, the, the Muslims were going through a great deal of hardships in the, those times. They didn't have a lot of time just to relax and focus on their ibadah. You know, so that they sought their reward through their striving. So if you're struggling with, you know, the obligations that you have on you right now in your life, in your life stage, then like I said, change your mindset to thinking that I'm in a stage of striving for the sake of Allah in what I'm doing, inshallah. I can't expect to be having this, you know, relaxing um, Ramadan of Ibadah like the other sisters who don't have those obligations on them like I have. You know, but your time will come, inshallah, sisters. Those kids grow up, things change, they go to school, whatever happens, you get more time to yourself, inshallah. Be in and out. Ask Allah that one day you, you will, you know, get that real taste of, of relaxing in Ramadan and enjoying it, inshallah. But it will come. Be in and out. Um, I'm going to finish up now, but we can leave some of the other things to the questions. But let's just say, dear sisters, the most important thing in getting the most out of Ramadan, inshallah, when you're busy, is you need to come to Ramadan having husnavan in Allah. You need to come to Ramadan having husnavan, having the highest hopes with Allah that Allah is going to bless you in this Ramadan. Okay? And Allah says in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِيْنَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلُنَا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمَعَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Allah Ta'ala says, Those who strive for our sake, لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُلُنَا Whoever strives for our sake, Allah will open his paths to you. He will open the paths. So it's got to do with your heart to start off with. If you enter Ramadan with husnavan, hoping for the best Ramadan from Allah, then when you strive for that, Allah will give it to you. And he'll open up ways for you to have the best Ramadan, inshallah, bi'idnillah, and to attain the highest reward in this month, inshallah. And Allah says, وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ لَمَعَ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Allah is with those who do good. 
So the more you strive, the more you seek ihsan with Allah, you, the more you'll find Allah helping you to achieve your aims. I ask Allah Ta'ala to let us all reach Ramadan. And I ask Allah Ta'ala to bless us in our Ramadan. And I ask Allah Ta'ala to make us from those who he forgives in his Ramadan and accepts our prayers in Ramadan. And he helps us to pray to him throughout the days and nights with ikhlas to him, inshallah, in this Ramadan. And I ask Allah Ta'ala to accept our fasting and help us to reach a level of ihsan in our fasting and help us to reach a level of ihsan in our prayers. And I ask Allah Ta'ala to make us from those who he saves from the hellfire in this month. And I ask Allah Ta'ala to accept all of our deeds and to bless us in this Ramadan. And I ask Allah Ta'ala to relieve the suffering from all of our brothers and sisters around the world. May he make this Ramadan a healing for the hearts of the Mu'mineen all around the world, inshallah. I ask Allah Ta'ala to not let any of us leave this gathering except that he's forgiven us. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barik ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik. Nashhadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.